Welcome to this CES 2021 Commit to Connect session. My name is Steve Ewell, and I'm the Executive Director of the Consumer Technology Association Foundation. The CTA Foundation is the charitable foundation affiliated with the Consumer Technology Association, the organization that runs CES. We launched the CTA Foundation about eight years ago as a way to give back on behalf of the industry, and we decided to focus in on two growing yet underserved areas of philanthropy, aging and disability. We see significant opportunities to help consumers, caregivers, and others learn about the technologies that can enable them to live, work, and play independently. At the heart of that mission from the very beginning has been the focus on addressing social isolation. We have been pleased to work with the Administration for Community Living and many other partners to address the needs over the last year, particularly to support the innovation of the teams that submitted to the Mental Health Innovation Challenge. I would like to congratulate the two teams here today, No Wrong Door Virginia and United Way Worldwide on being finalists and also recognize all of the other teams that submitted amazing ideas. We are thrilled to bring the challenge finals to CES this year. For more than 50 years, CES has been the global stage for innovation. And this year, our first as a digital show, I am excited to welcome our allies on this project as they display the power of partnership and technology to help those in need. Without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce Lance Robertson, the Assistant Secretary for Aging, an administrator for the Administration for Community Living for opening remarks. Welcome, Lance. Hey, thank you, Steve. Uh, we are so grateful uh, to the CTA Foundation for your support and for giving us time during CES to talk about this initiative. I hope it uh, has been an outstanding show and I know it always is. And if uh, anyone can make a virtual show great, it's certainly CES. So we're here to talk about social isolation and more important, what we can do to help people connect to others to prevent it. People of all ages experience social isolation and loneliness, but older adults and people with disabilities are particularly at risk. We know that one in three older adults lives by themselves. Nearly a quarter of Americans age 65 and older are socially isolated and more than 40% of those are feeling lonely. And that was all before COVID. And we don't have as much data, um, but we do know that there is certainly a significant issue as well uh, when it comes to social isolation for people with disabilities. Unfortunately, social isolation seems to be increasing and that trend began honestly, even before physical distancing to prevent COVID. In the past decade, the number of Americans living alone has grown 10%. And this trend has significant consequences. I think most people know that social isolation and loneliness are huge problems. The issue has gotten a lot of attention in light of the pandemic. What might not be as well known is the reality that this is a serious public health issue. Social isolation actually can be as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It increases the risk of heart disease, dementia, and even premature death. And beyond the human cost of social isolation, there's also financial repercussions. For example, an estimated $6.7 billion in annual Medicare spending is attributable to social isolation among older adults. And that's why addressing social isolation is an important component of the many programs that we fund here at my agency, the Administration for Community Living. Uh, we are part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and we exist to help make it possible for older people and people with disabilities to live independently in their community. The Aging and Disability Networks, which are found in every community across the country and include more than 20,000 community-based organizations, they all did a heroic job of finding ways to continue to help people connect to others and engage in the community, even during this year's physical distancing requirements. But very early in the pandemic, it became clear that a coordinated national approach was also needed to support these efforts. So in response, the Administration for Community Living pulled together partners from across the federal government, the Aging and Disability Network, philanthropy, and industry to tackle the challenge of combating social isolation during this pandemic and beyond. So let me quickly share the list of partners, starting with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Federal Communications Commission, the Department of Veterans Affairs, our colleagues in the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, the AARP Foundation, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, 
Meals on Wheels America, Leading Age Center for Aging Services Technology, the Georgia Tech Pass It On Center, and the Older Adults Technology Services, Advancing States, AT3, which is the State Assistive Technology Act Programs Technical Assistance Resource Center, the Consumer Technology Association Foundation, the National Council on Aging, the Colorado Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering, and the Coalition to End Social Isolation and the Foundation for Social Connection and more. It's a long list. And together we've created the Commit to Connect campaign, a public-private partnership that's doing a number of great things, starting with building a, a nationwide network of champions to collaborate on solutions to help us reach more people. Also working to develop an online consumer focused tool that matches people who are socially isolated to customize suggestions for resources that can help them connect and engage. Also establishing critical partnerships and communities and across all levels of government. And then finally sharing successful initiatives that can be implemented in communities across the country. Those are the four primary things and, and much more um, is brewing as well. And through a contract with the AARP Foundation, AARP has created a coordinating center to keep all of these components moving forward. So joining us today is Ms. Lisa Marsh-Rison, who is the president of the AARP Foundation. And uh, she is gonna talk to us a little bit about the AARP Foundation's longstanding work in social isolation and how they've continually been champions in combating it and how the coordinating center will help us move that work forward. So Lisa, it's, real, it's a real honor to have you on today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Lance. And it's so great as always to be with you and Steve, such champions of finding effective solutions to combat social isolation. But a special thank you to you, Lance. AARP Foundation is delighted to be working with the Administration for Community Living to help make your bold vision of ending social isolation a reality. As you know, we share that vision and we have for many years. We appreciate your continuing support of our work and your expert leadership in the field. As you noted, AARP Foundation has long recognized the importance of addressing the public health crisis of social isolation that affects the health and well being of so many older adults and people with disabilities. And for the last decade, AARP Foundation has been leading a movement to increase public awareness and develop effective solutions to address it. The pandemic, as you've shared, has made our work ever more urgent, increasing social isolation for people of all ages, but especially for older adults. In fact, a recent AARP study found that six in 10 older adults now report being socially isolated. And yet, despite this dramatic worsening of social isolation among people of all ages, far too many don't know where to go for help or what solutions might be most effective for them. We hope that our efforts today will be a giant step forward in addressing that problem. As many of you know, as you and Steve know for sure, earlier this year, AARP Foundation sponsored a National Academies a sciences, engineering, and medicine consensus study that provided guidance for all of us on how we, what we must do to come together to address social isolation and loneliness. And the study recommended, among other things, developing a more robust evidence base, improving public awareness of the health and medical impacts of social isolation and loneliness that you outlined, Lance, translating current research into healthcare practices, and strengthening the ties between the healthcare system and community-based networks and resources. These recommendations give us a roadmap to follow as we continue to work together to address social isolation and communities across our nation. And they will be essential to our partnership as we move forward. We're really proud to be the coordinating center. And at, as the coordinating center, we will organize efforts across sectors, and across organizations, all working together to determine the most effective ways to reach millions of socially isolated people in the United States. Several years ago, AARP Foundation spearheaded Connect to Effect, which is an online interactive platform that will be integral to launching a social isolation clearinghouse where individuals can seek out solutions. 
through research and through innovation, we've been working to create a deeper understanding of isolation to draw crucial attention to this important matter and to catalyze concerted coordinated action to end it. Our goal is to create a network of resources to meet the needs of anyone who is isolated, to help them build the social connections they need to thrive. And as the Coordinating Center AARP Foundation, we'll be able to leverage the infrastructure that we have and expertise, and the expertise of so many of the wonderful partners, Lance, who you called out in your introduction. We are delighted to be joined by leaders in the field working together to address this public health issue, this public health crisis. And we look forward to working together to help more people access effective tools and effective resources so that they can be connected and engaged. Like all of you, we are committed to connect. All right, well, thank you, Lisa. That's fabulous. Um, you're amazing. Really have uh, just been honored to work with you and thanks so much for the great work happening at the AARP Foundation. Thank you, Lance, a real delight and an honor to work with you and your wonderful team. All right, thank you. I mentioned that uh, one of the things that we're working on is developing an online tool for people who are socially isolated or at risk of social isolation. To kickstart that goal, ACL and the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health launched a prize competition last June. We're awarding $750,000 in prizes to teams who develop an easy to use online tool that will give users suggestions for programs, technologies, resources, and products that can help them get and stay connected and engaged. Those suggestions will be customized for their individual needs, interests, and abilities. We received 38 proposals, which we ultimately whittled down to two. And we could not have done that without our judges. And I wanna take a quick minute to say thank you to them. Uh, these included dozens of experts. We had uh, tech industry leaders such as Google and Microsoft, companies that focus on addressing social isolation, foundations like the CTA Foundation and the AARP Foundation, researchers, and many other experts. And also our judging panel included prospective users of the tool. So you can find a description of the eight semi-finalists as well as a list of our judges at our website, easy website, acl.gov. So acl.gov forward slash commit to connect. And a quick shout out to our contractor, Skilled, who has helped manage a challenge, including building the platform to collect applications and allow applicants to collaborate. So in just a minute, we'll hear from those finalists. But first, I want to introduce Dr. Leith States, who is a Chief Medical Officer at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and an absolute key partner for ACL in tackling this public health issue. Dr. States, glad to have you on, and I turn the floor over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Lance. As always, it's a pleasure to be with you, and it's an honor to be on the session with all the stakeholders online. Um, I'll be taking a moment to describe the challenge from the OASH perspective. As Lance and others have already described, social isolation and loneliness are drivers to a variety of poor health outcomes, both mental and physical. The health of the nation is built on the health of the communities. And it's absolutely vital that empathy, concern, and value for the individual be considered in this pursuit of collective health. Our narratives tell powerful stories and they are important. And social isolation is one that is widely shared by many individuals, whether that's on a personal level, either in a close friend or potentially even your family member. Uh, there's no shortage of novel ideas on how to decrease social isolation and loneliness, but good ideas on their own will not get the job done. It takes a village of stakeholders and community and individuals to transform these ideas into innovation that has an actual impact on those who need it most. Veterans, older adults, people with disabilities, and those living in facilities and group homes. And this investment in the identification, partnership, and scaling of pragmatic ideas that do the most good to those with the greatest need is in keeping with the mission of OASH. To that end, this two-phase challenge competition has the goal of serving as a bridge to catalyze consumer awareness and subsequent uptake of technology tools to, at, to assist at-risk individuals and social engagement programs through the use of matching algorithms developing accessible social engagement clearinghouse with the capacity to reach ultimately, hopefully the tens of millions of at-risk per persons. 
But before we get to that point, we need to recognize the finalists and complete this competition. So with that, I'll hand it back to Lance and thank you for the time. All right, Lee, thanks so much. You're amazing. It just is fabulous to work with you. Thanks for the champion that you have been. And I noticed during the COVID 2020, you've gotten a little gray in that beard, my friend. Yeah, it's uh, it's been hard to put off. The kids <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. So it's without further ado that um, it's now my honor to introduce you to the two finalists and to let them tell you a bit about their solutions. So um, you know, as Steve mentioned at the beginning, we're so proud to highlight both of them today. And we're going to start with the No Wrong Door, Virginia's Social Health Connector. And we do have a short video that we'd like to play now that describes their work. This is the story of 70-year-old Rosa Martin, who lives with her husband, Fred. This year, Rosa fell and broke her hip. The couple moved to a new apartment and COVID-19 has meant no friends, no family, and no in-person worship. Fred has become angry and prone to violent outbursts. Rosa now feels afraid and all alone. My name is Sarah Link, and I'm the director of No Wrong Door Virginia at Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, DARS. Our solution, called the Social Health Connector, SOHECO, draws from evidence discovered by scientists such as Julianne Holt Lundstedt, the late John Cacioppo, and VCU's own Tracy Gendron. Over a decade of practice-based evidence conducted here in Virginia around social isolation and neighborhood livability inform our work, and we use conditional logic and built-in intelligence for continuous quality improvement. Let's turn our attention back to Rosa's story. Imagine that Rosa arrives at the No Wrong Door Virginia site at the suggestion of a friend. Here, she explores some of the things that make up quality of life through the lens of the social determinants of health. This site meets the highest level of accessibility level triple A. Throughout, we use plain language text between third and fifth grade reading levels. Our portal offers Rosa 24-7 low-tech access to train two-on-one call specialists via a live chat or specialized toll-free line. From here, Rosa clicks into the SOHECO survey, which includes 30 questions related to Holt Lundstedt's typology of social connection, demographics, values and preferences, and free text questions for Rosa to reflect on who and what brings her joy in life. As she takes the survey, Rosa shares that she is married, she likes being around people, and that her neighborhood needs better sidewalks. The quality of our relationships is crucial. So we ask Rosa if she feels safe in her marriage. When she answers no, Conditional Logic immediately offers her information about national hotlines and a safe escape link. Rosa also shares that she likes cooking and knitting. With natural language processing, we can help Rosa find online knitting groups. Once Rosa completes the survey, she receives personalized plan with recommendations that she may print, save, or share. The results offer a visual depiction of Rosa's risk and protective factors so that we are framing her responses with evidence but without labeling her. Let's take a closer look at Rosa's recommendations. Here, Rosa finds the social connection assistive technology consultation that promises to help her communicate with loved ones and make things like shopping and home security easier. Rosa can actually electronically enroll in this service right away. By clicking enroll, Rosa self-directs into a program via No Wrong Door Direct Connect. In summary, we developed a prototype that integrates science with solution, leverages state no wrong door networks of community partners, including 25 area agencies on aging, centers for independent living, and Virginia assistive technology system. Builds on Virginia Navigator's resource database of more than 27,000 national, state, and local resources, was refined based on input from users with more than 200 beta testers, includes the ability to directly enroll in services, offers 24 seven access to help via 211 Virginia, and utilizes type form assessments in English and Spanish, conditional logic, natural language processing, and a shopping cart experience. With our solution, we look forward to establishing positive creative partnership and bringing to market an approach that is grounded in evidence, reflective of applied best practices, and poised to drop a single dynamic national solution. We want every Rosa and Fred Martin out there to know that there are people and organizations all across the country that are ready to support them and enrich their life's journey. All right, fabulous information. Thank you so much. Our uh, second finalist is UConnect from United Way Worldwide. 
And we also have a short video from UWW that we'd like to also show now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Aliberti. I work at United Way Worldwide and I'm representing Team Uconnect. I have some great colleagues here and some colleagues that are affiliate a purpose that have come together to build our prototype. First, we wanna thank the team at ACL for their support and thank everyone that has made the Mental Health Innovation Challenge possible. United Way Worldwide is the national office for the network of 1,100 United Ways across the U.S. and in 40 different countries and territories. We also provide leadership and support to the network of 240 different agencies that operate 211. 211 is a 24 seven hotline by phone, text, chat for social services that helps around 10 to 14 million people a year. And during, during COVID-19, that number has surged. 211 databases are a priceless collection of services, supports, and resources in every community and we will be bringing those together onto a single platform. Uconnect embraces existing community-based infrastructure. Two on ones, United Ways, no wrong door systems across the country and the local partnerships that make these resources possible. So on one powerful, simple site, we'll have national reach and local depth. You will see Uconnect has a simple user interface that quickly connects people to help. A couple clicks and they will see a map of resources in their community and then they can click on specific agencies and providers to learn more. It will meet and exceed accessibility guidelines like 508 and provide a welcoming environment that embraces interests and passions, not just needs and problems. We're thrilled to see what No Wrong Door Virginia has proposed. Their experience addressing social isolation, embracing um, research and evidence and their embrace of the no wrong door infrastructure is a perfect complement for our national platform. The final strength I want to focus on is that United Ways and 211s address a wide range of issues. Education, income, health, employment in every community. And the 211 network, they have a, a database altogether of over 900,000 records of supports for these social services. People's isolation may be caused by, or it may compound these other social needs. And we're proud to be building a solution that can support the whole person. We wanna keep adding partners and resources, and we hope that you will join us. And here is a quick overview video of Uconnect. Thanks. information. All right. So this is where I'm supposed to tell you who won. But uh, this is where things get a little interesting. Uh, who won, you ask? Well, we all did. Uh, because these two competitors recognized that each of them had strengths and that they could produce a better product by working together. So instead of awarding a first and second prize today, I'm instead announcing a new partnership. These two finalists will be joining forces and sharing the prize. And we will... Um, be bringing together, thankfully, the best of both solutions, the state and community navigation expertise in Virginia's No Wrong Door System Social Health Connector, and the breadth of data from United Way Worldwide 2-on-1s. So they'll work together uh, with the coordinating center led by the AARP Foundation that you've heard about to continue to develop, build, test, and scale a solution. In the coming weeks, we'll be announcing a governance council and a scientific advisory council which together will help ensure that these online resources include solid tools and information with protections for individual privacy and data. So there's a lot of exciting work happening as you can see, but we need everyone's help. I mentioned the Commit to Connect campaign and I'm asking everyone to commit. 
there are some key things we need to do as a nation if we're going to realize the promise of the online tool and the other things that we've been talking about today. We need to make technology accessible and available for all people, including people who have low incomes, who live in underserved communities or even under-resourced communities. That means we need a national infrastructure to develop and deliver digital solutions to those populations. We also need tools, technologies, and programs to populate the database that will build this online tool. And we need to build this in a way that makes sense. So let me start there. And I'm very happy to share that the online tool that we're building through the challenge will be hosted in the Microsoft Azure Cloud. And I wanna introduce Sid um, Chaverdi, who is with us today for Microsoft. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about why this makes a difference. Sid, we're so glad to have you on. Thanks for the great work that you do at Microsoft and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, Lance, uh, for the introduction and uh, more so calling it physical distancing instead of social distancing because uh, these words make a difference. And uh, I, I'm, I'm humbled to be here on the behalf of the AI for Health team, which is looking forward to sponsoring the collaborative solution uh, that is going to come forward. And it's a rich history of collaboration that we've sort of uh, worked on through 150 grantees in the AI for Health program, which is run through our philanthropic arm rather than a commercial arm. So it's more about sort of looking at how, how do companies and uh, partners come together to solve some of the world's hardest challenges. Uh, and, and we look to collaborate as opposed to compete, uh, value creation as opposed to value capture. And in a time where we are undergoing major cognitive dissonance with increased focus on uh, sort of breaking apart all these habits that we've built over time, uh, it is imperative for us to sort of look at initiatives such as mental and all the other initiatives that are being funded uh, to sort of allow people to have that mental safe space uh, as we undergo this tr transition uh, and recover from 2020. To that end, I think Microsoft can help uh, in, in a way where we can bring our uh, services from a technology platform uh, to enable these uh, innovative solutions to come to life in a meaningful uh, uh, applied innovation to help uh, the societal resilience uh, at, at the level, like you said, at the level of the individuals, the communities and the societies to, to see a better tomorrow. Uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It, it is absolutely humbling to be a part of this. Uh, uh, and on, the, on behalf of my team, I thank you all. Sid, thanks so much. Really, again, appreciate the support from Microsoft and just the great work that you guys are doing. Uh, so we also need to make sure that uh, we are considering individual needs and preferences as we build this. And we know that older adults and people with disabilities are not a homogenous group. As a matter of fact, the needs vary from person to person uh, to be sure, and, and there can even be differences between subsets of these populations. So for example, let's, let's talk about veterans. And with us today, we have Dr. Amanda Purnell, who is again here from the Veterans Administration to talk about the most critical needs that she knows about for the veterans who are also um, combating social isolation. So Amanda, glad to have you on and the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I'm so grateful to be here today to talk with you a little bit. So thank you again. The VA is delighted to partner with the ACL to help maintain social connection during our physical distance, um, especially among veterans. We know that military veterans present unique experiences of loneliness and social, social isolation, including the impact of losing touch with fellow service members, physical or mental health issues, and difficulty relating to civilians. We also know the importance of interventions being tailored specifically to veterans, especially veterans age 55 years and older, rural veterans, and veterans who do not utilize VHA healthcare services. The VA maintains phone, text, and web services to promote mental wellness, reduce social isolation, and prevent suicide. This includes the Veterans Crisis Line and authoritative evidence-based resources and toolkits to support communities, families, and veterans at risk. And we're committed to help support the winning solutions and delighted to be a partner 
in this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Really appreciate that. And as a veteran, thanks for the great work that the VA does every day. So that now brings me to my colleague from the uh, Federal Communications Commission or the FCC, Mr. Edward uh, Bartholomew. And we know that the FCC really has just been doing a great job in tackling uh, the best ways to bridge this digital divide. So we've asked, we've asked um, Mr. Bartholomew to sort of talk us through, hey, what's available now, what's in progress and what's needed from the industry. So we're so glad to have you on, Ed. Thanks so much for your time today and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Lance. Uh, let me start by saying congratulations to the finalists and thanking them for seizing this opportunity to address such an important issue. We're proud to partner with HHS and our other federal and private sector colleagues in support of this program and look forward to continuing to support the Commit to Connect campaign. The FCC, we understand the importance of connectivity and bridging the digital divide has been our agency's top priority. We've developed programs that subsidize monthly service costs for consumers and others that fund the infrastructure needed to expand broadband networks to communities not yet connected. So what's available now? One of the FCC's direct to consumer connectivity programs is Lifeline. Lifeline provides a $9.25 per month subsidy for wireless or wireline service that includes broadband to income eligible households and an additional $25 per month for qualifying consumers that live on tribal lands. You can learn more at lifelinesupport.org under Do I Qualify? That program will also benefit from some additional funding provided in the recently passed COVID relief bill, and we should have more information about that in the coming weeks. Another part of our work at the FCC is ensuring that communications technologies are accessible to persons with disabilities. Beyond ensuring the technology is accessible, certain disabilities require specialized and often expensive equipment to make use of plat communications platforms. To help connect the deafblind population, we developed the National Deafblind Equipment Program, which provides equipment to income eligible individuals with a qualifying disability. You can learn more at icanconnect.org. Outside of the FCC, there are great resources like Everyone On, a nonprofit organization that aggregates current offers and program information about low income or income subsidized low cost connectivity options. Uh, if you put in your zip code on the everyone.org website, you can learn more about the offers in your area. In line with today's theme of connectivity and health, the FCC also has a focus on the importance of connected care or telehealth. We have a connect to health task force that is dedicated to exploring the intersection of broadband, advanced technology and health. We've distributed hundreds of millions of dollars through our rural health care program and recently distributed $200 million in response to the pandemic through our COVID-19 telehealth program. In late 2020, we accepted applications for a longer term connected care pilot program designed to study how connected care can be a permanent part of the universal service fund by making available $100 million of service fund support over three years to help defray eligible healthcare provider costs of providing telehealth services to patients at their homes or mobile locations, with an emphasis on providing those services to low-income Americans and veterans. For things that are in progress, we have the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and the Connect America Fund. These programs provide funding to eligible providers so they can build out the networks that are needed to provide connectivity in unserved and underserved areas all across their country. We're also working to improve our broadband maps by collecting more granular data and making it easier for the public to provide input on the accuracy of our data. And you may have heard about 5G. We've been pursuing the 5G FAST plan and will continue to make Spectrum available to support our growing mobile data needs and to enhance the capabilities of mobile networks. The last thing that you asked was what we need from industry. From providers, continued investment in networks continue to build out coverage to areas that are unserved or underserved and continue to support our communities by offering low cost connectivity options. From device makers, continue to create technology that is accessible to everyone. 
Accessible design shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be baked in from the beginning. And across industry, continue to work with us and others to educate consumers and your customers about the relevance and benefits of being connected. Thanks, Lance. Hey, thanks so much, Ed. Just really um, grateful for the work that you guys are doing at FCC and for your partnership in this endeavor. So keep it up. So uh, folks, in closing, uh, those are just a few of the things that we know are in the works right now. And like I said before, though, we need everyone to commit to connect. And that means you. So here's how you can help. If you provide social engagement programs or technology, we want to hear about them. If you're a company that can help us bridge the digital divide for high risk and marginalized communities by providing internet enabled devices or access to the internet, we need to also hear from you. We'll follow up with you to learn more about you and your company and how you'd like to connect. And then finally, please do visit our website at again, acl.gov forward slash commit to connect. And there you'll find a link um, that will take you to all sorts of great information. You can sign up for email updates and um, even find out a little bit about a webinar that we're planning in March. So please join me in congratulating uh, the No Wrong Door Virginia and the United Way Worldwide organizations for working together and to collaboratively win the Mental Health Innovation Challenge. And thanks so much to all of you for your time today and for being a part of this uh, great effort and for your commitment in helping us address this critical public health crisis. Thank you. <music>